we'll continue. We're going to finish the fourth chapter this morning. Beginning in verse 7 and reading 10 verses of Scripture. James chapter 4, verse 7 through verse 17. <clears throat> Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be returned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Speak not evil of one another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judges his brother speaketh evil of the law and judges the law. But if thou judge of all, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? Go to now ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that you ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. <clears throat> this book of James has absolutely uh hopefully and absolutely uh opened your eyes i know it has mine the more that i have studied this book over the years the more information that god gives i think you remember now that it's not written to the lost man it's written to christians it's not written it's not written to show a man how to get his spirit saved we call that just straight salvation it doesn't teach salvation but rather as we have discovered it teaches salvation of the soul it teaches how to live your life to be accountable at the judgment seat of Christ and to gain the reward that day <clears throat> it's a very practical book as you remember the last two weeks starting in this fourth chapter God is showing some of the things that happens to Christians through their own nature. <clears throat> now I want to kind of reemphasize this. Remember that each one of you who are saved have two natures. You're different than the lost man who has only one nature. He has his own nature and he doesn't want to do anything but sin and he loves to sin. The old nature loves to sin. And he loves whatever his nature does. He doesn't understand that he's lost and he's bound for hell. And it doesn't bother him a bit. He's dead, spiritually. And so a dead person has no feelings in that regard. When you were saved and you trusted Jesus, he gave you a new nature. That new nature is himself living in you. It's the sealed Holy Spirit in your heart. And this new nature wants to do nothing but produce righteousness. And by the way, the new nature can't sin. I don't know whether you knew that or not, but it certainly is true. The new nature cannot sin because it's Christ himself in you. And your new nature has a great desire to please God. Your old nature, all it wants to do is sin. And so therefore, from the time that you become a Christian, you're going to end up having yourself 
the rest of your life here upon the earth, continuous battles in your life. The old nature battling against the new and the new against the old, as Paul says, so that you cannot do what you would. Uh, it just seems like it, whenever you're doing good, evil is with you, and whenever you do, whenever you don't want to do evil, you see, uh, it's still there. And you can't do anything that's good. So we have that battle back and forth. But you see, that battle is for a purpose. So that you, can, you may become an overcomer. Now, what are you overcoming? You're overcoming the old nature, which is the seat of the flesh. You also have the overcoming of the world that's around you. And you also have the overcoming of Satan. Remember that you can sin in three different areas. Satan can cause you to sin, the world can cause you to sin, or the flesh can cause you to sin. In a sense, you can sin in the body and in the soul and in the spirit. <laughs> uh, the spirit of man, that is, not the spirit of God. In a sense. But you see and understand that, that this, all these problems that seemingly happen to your life <laughs> is because of the struggle that's going on in you between the old nature and the new. And if you yield it to the old nature, he will then control the new. And you become a, just a carnal, fleshly Christian in the world. However, through the word and through the Holy Spirit and through God speaking to you and, and through exercising the things that he tells us today in this message, you can come to overcome the old nature with the new. Now, I'm sure I hear someone say, what's the difference? I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, I can't lose it. The difference is this, that there is a reward for those who become overcomers. Far beyond exceeding far beyond what man has ever thought of or heard of or even entered into his heart. He can't even imagine what it is. It's so grand. And uh, at the judgment seat of Christ, it is decided whether a man receives a reward or suffers loss. For he must receive those things done in the body, whether good or evil. Now, James is trying to show us how to have a grand entrance into this coming kingdom of the Lord. And then how, from that point on, as you must already know that once you gain this reward, it is also beyond the kingdom on into the eternities, the ages of the ages. As we started in this fourth chapter, and as we've seen in this fourth chapter, you know, he began to speak of the old nature. Wars and fightings among you, verse 1. See, from, where, where, from whence do they come? Uh, where do the lusts come that war in your members? Members of the body, speaking of the flesh now. Then he speaks of life living in the old nature. It says, those Christians who are living in the old nature, they continuously lust and have not. That word lust means desire. They want this. They want that. But they don't have the money to buy it. Or they want this and they can't get it. <laughs> and their life seems to be, you know, just stuck. They never move. See? You lust. You desire. And you can't have. You kill. Word kill here also means the way that you think about your brothers. You know, all you have to do is think evil of your brothers, you know, and Jesus says you've already killed. So it's your attitudes even towards one another. And you desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and you war and you cannot have anything. Now he stops and says, mainly because you never ask. <laughs> never even stop to ask God for it. And then when you do stop to ask him, he's not going to give it to you because you're in the wrong nature. 
instead of the new nature, you're in the old nature because you do it in order to get it, to get it on, to spend it on your lusts, what you want to do with it. See? We're not here to serve self. We're here to serve Christ. And you are a servant of the Lord. And I'm a servant of the Lord. And he's called us. And whatever he's called us to do, he can well finance it, believe you me. He can take care of that. And then James called us something else here in that fourth verse, if you remember. Those of us who live in the old nature, he called us adulterers and adulteresses. He says, you know, it's possible to get and sold in love with the world that you act like an adulterer or an adulteress to God who's supposed to be first in your life. And from that, a relationship of the world can develop to the degree that you become a friend of the world and that friend of the world makes you an enemy of God. There are many, many enemies of God today in the world. I'm talking about in the church. Meaning they're Christians, but meaning they're worldly Christians to the degree that they become enemies of God. And that's the sense that James is, James is talking about here. And as you remember last week, there is a greater chance of uh, consequence, negative consequence, if you're an enemy of God, a greater chance uh, well, it's a certainty. It's not really a chance. If you continue to be a friend of the world, to have great punishment at the judgment seat of Christ, there's various kinds of punishment. If you want to use that word punishment, you're, it's a good word. Understand this, <clears throat> that when you become a member of a family, when you're born of that family, you can't lose your fact that you're born into him. You can't become unborn. <laughs> your son or your daughter, if they did anything, even to the point of going to prison, they'd still be your son or daughter. Why? Because they've been, they've been born into the family. You've been born into the family of God. You cannot lose what God has given you as far as your salvation. You do have eternal life because he has saved you. But you can lose all the fellowship with God, the fellowship of Him being your God and your Lord and directing you in all things and giving you peace and giving you victory and giving you prosperity even here upon this earth. You can lose all that if you decide to live for the world and... Uh, you can get to the point to where you even become an enemy of God, even as you can become an enemy of your father, earthly father here upon the earth. And have total, you won't even be speaking to him. You have total uh, uh, break of fellowship. Well, there are consequences. There are negative consequences for this that is yet. And this is the one thing that's not being taught to the church. The church does not know today about uh, one day they're going to have to be held accountable. So accountability is not being taught. And yet it's all through the epistles of the apostle Paul, Peter. Here we see it in James. It's all through the New Testament. Accountability to God. All right, now, he has shown us the old nature. Now he's going to begin this morning to show us how we can withdraw from the old nature and how we can get victory. You see? He begins in verse 7, to first submit yourselves to God. Now that gets down beyond the topsoil and anchors yourself into the bedrock. <laughs> the rock underneath, this is Christ. Submit. Submit yourself. Submit your life. Submit everything into your life to, that is that, that you that that makes you up. You see, submit all that to God. Now, this begins with reading the Word daily. 
Folks, you can't submit yourself to God without power to do so. And that power comes from the Word. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And when you read the Word of God, acknowledge that God is speaking to you. When you read the Word, He causes you in your reading to have that wisdom to understand what He's saying to you if you ask Him. And the words, certain words will jump right off the page and that's, you know, God's speaking right to you. Okay. This is submitting first to God in reading the word and finding out what he is saying to you. Secondly, in submitting to God, you should be talking to God. Communication does wonders. When you get down on your knees and you're by yourself and you start talking to God, that does wonders particularly when you understand that has, sin has to be confessed first. <clears throat> well, sometimes we do a lot of talking, but it's not to God. Sometimes we talk about others, too. That's the old, out of the old nature. Hannah Woodall Smith wrote a book, book How to Stop Talking About Others. <laughs> Good book. One of the things she says is when this begins to happen, you hear people talking about other persons, take those two people and bring them together. Or if you hear someone say something about you, then get that person and go to that person and bring the other third party and let's put it all, let's bring it all, let it all hang out and let's look at it. <laughs> you know what generally happens? Well, when you come face to face with the problems, and what is said, that begins to fade away when you begin to see what it is. It begins to fade away. Go back to God when you are out of fellowship and begin talking to him about it and those problems will begin fading away. Submit yourself to God. Submission also means to obey his commandments. Now, there is an order of submission, folks, in the Bible. Christ submits to God the Father. All of us submit to Christ. Wives, submit yourself to your husbands. Children, submit yourself to your parents. There is an order of submission. We need to stay within that order. Submit by reading the Word, by talking to God, by obeying His commandments. And then he tells us in this seventh, as we go back to our text, beginning in this seventh verse, he says, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Now, you see, first of all, you've got to acknowledge the fact that Satan exists. <laughs> you know, a lot of people don't even acknowledge that. They think he's a principle, but no, he's a person. He's a person. And you cannot overcome him and neither can I. But the Lord can, and he's already living in you. And the scripture says, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. We're not powerful enough to overcome Satan, but God is. Now, Satan is very powerful. But he's nowhere near as powerful as God who made him. He's the creator. Satan is just a creature. He's made by God. Now, he thinks at times that he's as powerful. One time, you know, before he fell... Through pride, he says, I'm going to build my house as my house as high as God, my throne as high as God's, and he fell in his own pride. Thought he was so beautiful and so powerful. That's where he fell. He still has his power. And don't, don't let him fool, don't get fooled about this. I mean, he is very, very powerful, and, and you can fall under, you know, this power unless... Unless first you submit yourself to God and then resist him. Now let me tell you the orb in which, this, in which Satan really operates. <clears throat> you know, we talk about the gambling halls and the brothels and the saloons and all that. And of course that's under the influence of Satan. But he doesn't really operate in that. You see, the flesh is all it takes for that. Take Satan away and totally, uh, you know, take him out of the picture and our flesh would still draw us to that. That's our old nature. He doesn't really worry about that. He's already got that influence. Who does he worry about? Does he worry about the lost man? No, he don't worry about the lost man. He's already going to hell. 
Uh, you see, Satan's influence, what he's interested in more than anything else, is the Christian. Now, he knows he can't take your salvation away from you, but he can sure take your joy away and your reward. So he's concerned to doing this. And if you look today around the world, I don't mean just take a cursory glance, but really study what's happening in the Christian world today. You'll find out more than at any time in the time of man there are these false religions that are spinoffs of the true Christianity that be are totally false. Totally false. Sex and, uh, and, uh, and uh, cults and occults and all these things which try to get themselves uh, some kind of legitimacy by coming out of some kind of Christian movement. And they're all of Satan because they all have these things that uh, deal with uh, uh, the world, uh, that deal with the Lord of this world, the God of this world, which is Satan himself. Uh, always the first thing in a cult, remember to let you know that it's a cult, is that no cult will, will, will recognize and teach that Jesus Christ is God, that he has any deity whatsoever. That's where it breaks down right there. When they tell you he's an archangel or when he's something else or he's just a good prophet, you know right then that it's a cult. But Satan is causing all these cults to come forth in this last day. He's interested in trying to get Christians into these cults. And guess what? They're going in by the thousands, a lot of them. They're getting into them. They're apostatizing. They're falling away from the true Lord, from their true Lord, from the true Christ. We see a little bit of this in the parable of wheat and the tares, don't we? We see the wheat, and then we see the tares being sown. They look just like the wheat. <laughs> They're children of the devil. And so many of us want to go around and start pulling up tares. And God says, no, that's not the way you do it. <laughs> that's not why I've got you commissioned to pull up tares. Just leave them alone. Go on and sow the wheat, the true word of God. Let me say something here, though. You know, all things are already preset. Of course, we have the election of God in all things. There's such a thing as a sheep and a lost sheep. A sheep is one who's saved, and a lost sheep is one who will be saved. He went to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Remember that? There's also goats. God uses the word goats. In the sense that here we have a here, here we have someone that will never become saved. A goat cannot become a sheep. <laughs> he also uses in the script in the scriptures uh, for these false sects. Sometimes uh, he uses hogs and dogs and goats. <laughs> hogs and dogs and goats, and they're always lost. And a wheat can never become a tear, even though a tear looks exactly like a wheat. Different. Now you may ask, how do I resist the devil? It's all written here in James. Let's start here in verse 8. Draw nigh to God. Draw nigh to God. Well, we know we need to first submit and then resist. Now we draw nigh to God. This is how we resist the devil. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. You know what Jesus said when he was tempted by Satan? You remember his temptations, three of them? The devil was dumb enough to try to use the, spirit of the, the, the sword of the Spirit. He thought he knew how to use the sword of the Spirit. So he's quoting Scripture to Jesus, and he misquoted it. And quoted it out of context, just like he's always done. And he does it through all his, his faults, uh, uh, occult cults, and, uh, and uh, false religions. <laughs> Jesus turned to him and said, it is written. <laughs> and that's how he came back to Satan, by quoting it the way that God wanted it quoted. It is written. And the scriptures tells us, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against God. 
Not only read the Word, begin learning it and quoting it to yourself every day. So you start off, you see, by understanding that your sword is the sword of the Spirit, and it's, but use it correctly. It is through the Word. Secondly, as we see here, draw nigh to God, and He'll draw nigh to you. Draw nigh to God, and He'll draw nigh to you. Now, if you earnestly draw nigh to God in your prayer, and it's what you really want, then God will draw nigh to you. And that will give you the power to resist Satan. I remember the illustration of the man and the wife going down the road in a car, and another car passed them. And, you know, there were two in that front seat, but it looks like there was two heads growing off the same stem. You ever seen that? <laughs> and she said to him, you know, I can remember the day when we were like that. And he said to her, I haven't moved. I haven't moved. God's saying something like that to us. God had moved. He's right back there in the middle of the road where we left him. We need to learn to draw nigh to God. God hasn't moved. Our sins have separated us between us and God. You know, the Old Testament illustration I love so good, it's really, it's a well, it's really a type. Those of you know anything about Isaac, Isaac was a well dug digger. He dug wells everywhere he went. He no sooner dig a well and the Philistines would come and throw rocks in it and, and, and fill it up. <laughs> he finally gave up one day. You see, that was, that was Satan filling up the hole through the Philistines. And the well represented his part of his uh, livelihood. The water, you know, for his sheep and everything. So it finally dawned on him one day. He said, I'm going to give up and go back to uh, Bethel. Go back home. And he went back home to Bethel. And as you study this man's life, the first thing he did was build an altar. And the second thing he did was build tent, a tent, a good tent, you see, to live in, in his family. And then the third thing he did was big, dig a well for his sheep. And his enemies came up to him, you see, and they said, let's have peace. <laughs> let's have peace. No more filling in any, any wells. And he said, why? And they said, we see that God is with you. Now that's a very important answer. We see that God is with you. Why? Because, you see, Isaac got his priorities lined up right. The first thing he did was put God first, and that's shown by the altar that he built. The second thing is after he got himself right with God, he built a tent, which is an emblem of his family, taking care of his family. His family comes second. And then his business came third. He dug the well. <laughs> and his enemy says, let's be friends. Let's have peace. We see that God's with you. Okay, how do we resist the devil? Here's another reason. Here's another way, I should say. Cleanse your hands. Cleanse your hands. And that's what he's saying here. Yeah, cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your heart, you double-minded. That's verse 8. Reminds me of God over in Exodus chapter 30. I'll read you some scripture here. Beginning in verse 17 of the 30th chapter of Exodus. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Thou shalt also make a laver of brass, and his foot also of brass to wash withal, and thou shalt put it between the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, and thou shalt put water therein. When, that, when they go into the tabernacle of the congregation, they shall wash with water that they die not, or when they come near to the altar to minister to burn offering made by fire unto the Lord, they shall wash their hands and their feet, and they shall die not, and it shall be a, a statute forever to them, even to him and to his seed throughout their generations. <clears throat> now here's another type, folks. The tabernacle 
of God that Moses built from the pattern that was shown to him is a beautiful type of how we approach God and how God approaches us. As we enter into the courtyard of the tabernacle, there's a great brazen altar which stands for the cross. And the blood that is shed there is shed is, is a type of the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed on the altar of the cross. And after we trust him as Savior, Savior there at that brazen altar, we are to cross the yard and enter into the tabernacle, the place of service as a priest. Because we all are priesthoods of the, have the priesthood of the believer. We all have that, uh, we all have that right to approach God personally. But before we could go into service, we had to wash ourselves. And outside of the tent door, Moses was to make a laver. It was like a stem with a bowl on the top and a big bowl on the bottom all made out of brass. It was full of water. And these priests, and you're a priest now, coming from the brazen altar, the cross, crossing over to enter into service, had to take the blood that was on their hands and wash and then with the feet, cleanse their feet from the, from the dust of the world before they could enter in. And if they didn't do it, they'd die as they entered in. God's trying to show us that in our life. We need to continuously keep ourselves clean. And by the water, by the way, the water, the water in the labor stands for the word. And that's how he cleanses us, by the word. <laughs> The Word and the Spirit here are the same. The Spirit wrote it, and it's the power of the Spirit in the Word. Cleanse your hands. Cleanse your hands. Sinners and double-minded, purify your hearts, you double-minded. All right. Then he tells us to humble ourselves in sight of the Lord. Verse 10. Humble yourselves inside of the Lord and keep, and he shall lift you up. So there's an humbleness. Humbleness. Before you can humble, though, you need to weep. Isn't that what it says in verse 9? Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. <clears throat> this means weeping for your sins. Not only your sins, but the sins of others that you see. You're weeping for theirs too. This makes you humble. Now turn with me to Romans chapter 12. I want to show you something here. You want to find the will of God now. I'm going to show you how to do it according to the word. Chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Oh, dear Christian, God wants that sacrifice of your bodies upon the altar. But he doesn't want a dead body. He wants a living body. This is a living sacrifice, one that stays alive and yet is sacrificed unto God. And this is only just your reasonable service. Doesn't make anything exceptional. It's what every Christian ought to do. Then verse 2, And be not conformed to this world. I'll give you, the, give you what it really means in your language. Don't let the world put you into its own mold. Don't let the world put you into its own world. Don't let them make you over the way they want to make you over. Do away with the peers that you have, if you have any peers. Be followers of God and not a bunch of others that are that you call peers. Don't worry about what they think about you. See? Be not conformed to this world, and be ye, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, it means that your mind where the Spirit is will be continually growing and being transformed 
as you stay in the word and by the way it's automatic you don't have to say that i've read the word now let me see what do i got to do to get transformed the more that you read of the word and the more you say yes lord i see it and yes lord i commit to it the more this happening the more that this happens the more that your mind will be transformed and it's transformed automatically automatically you become closer to God you become more Christ-like okay. and when this happens you will automatically prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God in your life see in order to find God's will in your life in order to find that, it, it, it costs, doesn't it? There's a price to pay. First, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Second, to not be conformed to this world by having your mind transformed automatically, you see, renewing of your mind through the Word of God. Through the Word of God. All right. Cleanse your hands, weep over your sins, humble yourself in the sight of God, learn what His will is for your life, and then not to think more highly of yourself. Become humble. Isn't that what that says in that same 12th chapter of Romans? Look in verse 3. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, think not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Let's go back to our text now. Verse down, we're down here in verse 12. <clears throat> uh, 12, 13, 14, and so forth to the end of the chapter. He wants us to know some other things. He First of all, he tells us not to speak evil of anyone and then say that you walk with the Lord. <laughs> you know, 1 John brings this out. He says, you uh, speak evil of your brother and you say you walk with the Lord, you're a liar. <laughs> you don't walk with the Lord. You may be saved, but you're not walking with him. You're in darkness still. You've passed the brazen altar you want to enter into, you haven't washed your hands, you haven't washed your feet, you're wandering in the courtyard after the sun is down. And by the way, that speaks of the evening oblation and afterwards when the candles are lit inside or when the lampstand is lit. All you're doing is wandering in the darkness between the cross and service. Oh, how many millions of Christians have been saved and they could never enter in because they want to live their own life in this world. Yeah, but he says, you know, you must, you must not speak evil of your brother. If you say that you speak evil and walk with the Lord, then you're a liar. That seems to be the indoor, sports of, uh, the indoor sport of a lot of Christians, to speak evil. To learn, try to learn something, maybe. Try to go run, tell it somebody else. And to maybe add to it a little bit and make it even bigger before you get there. Well, folks, that's the old nature. We all, you know, we all can fall to this. That's the old nature. Dig down and get yourself anchored into Christ on these things. You know, Romans 14, in, in that book, in that chapter, it says, Who art thou that judges another? Particularly when that uh, other man's servant is God. <clears throat> we can't judge another man who's a Christian as to what God wants him to do. We can know from Scripture if a, what a man is doing is wrong, but we can't judge as to what is, is right some, in so some many cases. I can't judge another pastor, another minister, when he... You know, what, uh, how he does in his ministry, uh, how he preaches, that's, that may be the way that God wants him to preach. So there's no judgment. There's no judgment. There's no judgment against another person. 
Now, if it's sin, and you see sin, then you know that's not of God. But he's just simply saying, you know, watch what we say. And as we go back to other scriptures, make sure that you pull the two before out of your own eye before you try to take a speck of dust out of somebody else's. Okay. It's the grace of God that gives us everything that we have. And you know, sometimes I look at others and I say, you know, as, as they have fallen, you know, and I say, except by the grace of God, there am I. <laughs> Next time you see some poor old, poor old gutter bum in the gutter, you know, drunk or something, and don't say, oh, you know, <laughs> oh, this, you know, oh, oh, how terrible this is. Oh, beloved, we all have our old natures. You can say, except by the grace of God, there am I. None of you'd be saved except that the Lord saved you. None of us, I should say, because I'm part of that too. Everything that we have is because God has given it to us. Be ready to help and not to tear down. And then he says, here in verse 14, he says, don't go to a city and say, I'm going to stay there two years and I'm going to buy and gain and make gain, you know, make a profit, buy and sell, make a profit and come home. He says, you don't know what's going to happen no more. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. No you may not even live past, you know, past tomorrow. You say, if it's God's will, this will happen. And then he continues to say, he says, life is but a vapor. Like a morning mist. That's your life. That's my life. It comes, and then it's gone. Eternity is forever and ever and ever. Now imagine an endless line and take one quarter inch of that and say that's life upon the earth with a little curtain and you're behind it. And God has given you the right to have faith. And if it measures up to a point, you see, of this faith of trusting Christ, you have eternal life. Or if it goes beyond that, where you continuously believe and trust, his word and you be what he wants you to be then you have not only eternal life but with great reward it could it be way out in the eternity of ages we would be saying to herself oh i wish i could go back behind that curtain for another five minutes so that i could trust god more well life is but a vapor What is God trying to teach us here in the last part of this fourth chapter? You want to receive the reward and go into the kingdom? Live for Christ. You got two natures now. You got to have one nature that is the new nature. Control the old nature. And how do you do this? Number one, you resist the devil. Number two, you draw, to, draw nigh to the Lord. Number three, you wash yourselves from sin continuously number four you humble yourself before god number five you don't speak evil of your brother number six you don't judge your brother 